Our Bible study today is on 1 Corinthians 9, starting in verse 24. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for uh, Paul's words of wisdom as you led him through the power of your Holy Spirit to write this letter to the Corinthians and also to us that we might uh, remember that uh, life is like a race and that uh, it's not about how fast we're going or how well we're doing as much as it is that we persevere. It's a marathon. Help us to run our race of faith uh, to reach our goal of being with Jesus, uh, not because we're good enough, but because by God's grace, Jesus has already won the race and we are uh, striving to meet him at the finish line. We want to be there in heaven with Jesus and all those who've gone before us that we might uh, celebrate the goodness of our God in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this, um, this last part of chapter 9, Paul had started out in this chapter, last time we were studying this, uh, talking about his right to be an apostle, and then he gives um, several metaphors about you know, uh, what it's like to, to work for the Lord. Right? And so one of his metaphors is talking about being a soldier, and as a soldier, you know, you have the right to obey. Right? And he was saying, as, a, as an evangelist, he had the right to receive um, his livelihood by preaching the gospel. But he said that I chose not to use my, my right so that those who would hear my message at, at the Church of Corinth would, um, he wanted them to, to know that he cared so much about their salvation that he didn't want to take anything. He wanted to give the gospel free of charge so that everybody who heard it, you know, nobody could accuse him of you know, trying, to, trying to get money out of him. And so he said, you know, it is my right to receive a pay, but I, I give that right up because of my love for you and for the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then he talked a little bit about um, his freedom as, uh, and how he, he has the right as a Christian that you know, there's a lot of things in this life that he could do, but he gives up some of those rights for the sake of other people. You know, like the Jewish people insist that you have to follow the kosher laws, and he says, in Jesus Christ, those things have been fulfilled. I don't have to do those, but I will act as a Jew with Jews so that I'll be able to share the gospel with them. Because if you offend people, they won't listen to you. Okay, so now in verse 24, he says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. So, in a way, when he said, you know, he's talking about the kind of uh, races that they had during the Olympics. And the Olympics predated the time of Jesus. So, you know, by the time of Jesus, people were still, the, the Greeks started the Olympics. The Greek empire started around 333 BC with um, Alexander the Great, who took over everything from like Spain all the way to India, a huge empire. And then he died as he was coming back from India from a fever. And then his, his generals divided the Greek empire into th three main sections. There was the Seleucids, the Ptolemies, and, and I can't remember the third one, but that was on the, uh, the west side of the empire. And so as they took over, they were a little bit weaker. They, but the games continued. And, it, and when the Romans in 63 AD, uh, BC took over the Greek empire, in essence, they kind of just swallowed it up. I mean, they took it over, but they didn't get rid of, of the, Greek, um, the, the Greek culture. So they adopted the gods. Right? They just gave them new names. So like Zeus became Jupiter, right? And so and so they just named they just renamed them, but they had the same gods, they had the same Hellenization. Hellenization is that is a Greek word that talks about Greek culture, right? Mm -hmm. So they adopted Hellenization. So they you know they had the bathhouses, they had the togas, they had the the amphitheaters, they had the drama, you know, like the dramatic uh, um, plays that they could, that the Greeks had. The Romans loved this stuff. Yeah, and, and so when he talks about the races, he's talking about something that the Romans continued, which would have been, bless you, he continued the, uh, like the Olympic Games. Now, if you're running a race, obviously one person is going to win the race. Uh, but um, does this mean that only one, you know, it almost sounds like if you're running this race with a bunch of other Christians to get to heaven, only one person is going to get to heaven? Well, no, that's not what he's talking about. But he, he is saying that in your race of faith, you can either win or you can lose. And it depends on if you persevere. Because if you drop out of a race, 
then there's no way you can ever get, uh, you know, to get a prize, mm -hmm. right? So he's not saying uh, you have to be number one, but he's saying that you have to finish, mm -hmm. right? Race. You have to finish the race. Sure. Because you could, let's say you believe in Jesus, you spend your life in the church, you read your Bible, and then, you know, your whole life, and then at the end of your life, you kind, you kind of start thinking, you know, oh, my health is bad. I lost my spouse. You know, I've lost my house. My money is gone. God, maybe God is not real. Maybe it doesn't matter. And you give up. Maybe you, you might spend your whole life in faith, but if you abandon the faith, then, you know, then you've quit the race and you can't win. The, the prize he's talking about isn't so much a prize that you win. It's really... Um, you know, this metaphor kind of breaks down when you look at it as if, you know, oh, as a Christian, you have to do your work to get to heaven. No, it's, it's not saying, talking about that. He says, run in such a way as to get the prize, and the prize is eternal life. And then verse 25, he said, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. So the point here is more on, on what an Olympic runner needs to do in order to, to be a, uh, able to win a race. You have to persevere. So the training that's involved, I mean, you know, think about how Olympic runners and other um, athletes have to train. You know, the Olympics only come around every four years. Yeah, well, no, no. That's just the way they did it, right? And in those four years, you had to train. So just imagine, their whole job was training, right? So like, you know, people, some people have a, an office job, they go to the office every day. If you're a, an athlete, your job is to you know, is to practice. Now, how in the world do you support yourself if you're doing that? Well, just as modern day athletes have sponsors, so in the ancient world, they did the same thing. They had like uh, people who sponsored those who they wanted to win, right? So uh, you would, it, it would be your job to go into training full time. So you're exercising every day, you're strengthening, and it's all for that one race. Just imagine, four years of training for that one time that you're gonna race. And especially if it's like the 100 meter dash, yeah. we're talking about spending four years for 10 seconds, 10 right? Seconds. 10 seconds. The, the world's record for the 100 meter dash is under 10 seconds. It's like 9.4 or something like that. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's, it's, it just shows to show that there are things in our life that everything that we're doing is we're training for a point in, you know, in our life that may make or break. Maybe you don't know what that is. But, yeah. but, but there's going to come a time where our faith is tested, and it is the testing of that faith that is the reason why we are in training. Mm -hmm. We are reading God's Word. We are in prayer. We're going to church, not because we have to, but because it is the place in which our faith is stretched and strengthened and prepared for perseverance. So then when we're tested, when we have to put it to the test, like, like in a race, then we won't fail, we won't fall out, we won't quit. Uh, it's easy to quit when you're out of shape. You're all, you know, oh, I'm so tired. Why? I can't keep going. But if you've been in training, you can keep going. So think about this metaphor of the race. It's similar to the metaphor of when Jesus talked about the sower, right? In Luke's gospel, there was a man, a, a farmer who went to sow seed, and some of the seed fell on the path, and of course it's not going to grow there, right? Because it can't put, produce any root. And then if some fell in the rocky soil, it starts to grow, but it's shallow soil, so it doesn't, it, when the sun comes out, it dies. And then there's the ones that grows in the weeds, and they're competing with other weeds, and the weeds overtake it, and then they die. And then there's the good soil. And so to have, to have the seed growing in the good soil is like being the, the athlete who's trained well. Mm -hmm. Not every athlete's gonna win because the ones who haven't trained and who haven't, you know, that's been lazy or haven't mm -hmm. cared enough uh, are not going to win the race. You know, like, um, not so much a lack of faith, but just not stronger, strong in the word where you have babes in Christ. Right. Only drinks milk. There's some who are babies in, in their faith, and if you're a baby in your faith and you never grow, then things will come along that will cause you to give up and to not continue, and God doesn't... So what is that scripture, like the wind blows... Don't go by every wind. Right. Yeah, don't allow just every wind of teaching to sway you. Right. That's the one you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's lots of different metaphors. So in the one about the, the seed, the soil with the seed, the seed is the word of God, Jesus says. And so when he says that, he's saying that 
um, you know, your heart is like the soil, but the seed is the word of God. And God causes the seed to grow, but it has to have a place to grow. So for the athlete, you know, how are you going to win the prize? The prize is heaven. And that, you know, you might say, well, what is the faith? The faith is, um, is maybe the desire to compete that God puts in you. And we can choose, once God gives that to us, we can choose to, to squander it and not uh, practice and not persevere, not, you know, strength train. Or we can do what it takes in order to make that, uh, that a reality, to, to win the prize. So every Christian has the possibility of winning the race of faith if they finish the race of faith. Uh, and he, he goes on with some more information of, uh, in verse 25. He talks about everybody who goes into the games, com, uh, goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Okay. So remember in the Olympics, the original Olympics, what did they win when they won a race? Do you remember? Okay. It's a crown. What was it made of? Do you know? Laurel. Very good. Laurel leaves. Laurel leaves, it, they, look like, um, they look like olive branches, right? They're, they're long, thin and so sometimes you've seen on Greek statues, they'll have the, the laurel leaves made of uh, gold, right? They're usually uh, the shape of a, like, a, like a U. And so they sit on your head, and they, they don't, it's not a complete circle. And they just sit there, and they would give you this token of the, for the winner. And, you know, it seems kind of silly. You're running to win this thing that's really worth nothing because it's, you know, within a couple of days it turns brown, you know. It, it's just, they're just leaves. But it was a symbol of the honor and the prestige of being the winner. Now, if people are willing, this is the argument, if people are willing to run for something that is really not that important, just think how much more we should be running the race of faith for something that is actually very important, which is eternal life. Go ahead. Oh, I, I, I agree uh, with what you're saying here. The question I have is, oh, the point I want to make, I guess, is, is one has to be careful not to get to to begin to believe that uh, we we achieve our salvation by this race that we run. The salvation right. was given to us by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Exactly. Who ran his race and continues to run his race. Right, and and that, Paul's going to get to that point, mm -hmm. uh, and and that's definitely important. And I think that the difference is how Paul talks about two aspects of the Christian life. One, he talks about justification, and he talks about sanctification. So justification is something that God does for us through Jesus Christ, he saves us. And sanctification is how we respond to our salvation, which is the race of faith. So here, he's, in essence, he's not saying that you can earn salvation, but he's talking about persevering in your salvation, which is sanctification. So it's a race to sanctification. For sanctification. Right, sanctification yeah, is continuing yeah. to do the good deeds that God has created us to do in Ephesians 2 verse 10, right? We were created for good deeds. And so uh, if a person just gives up and stops living for the Lord, then maybe their faith will die, mm -hmm. right? So only God can give faith and only God can save a person. So this is not talking about saving. It's talking about um, continuing to live a life of response and sanctification for uh, the salvation God has already given you. So to some extent then, whereas the runner runs and puts his feet down on the ground, right. our running and putting our feet down is doing good deeds for others. It's looking for ways to help. Exactly. It's looking for support and encouragement of others. Very good. And, 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 yeah. Okay. So, so that's what you were saying originally was, is exactly true because elsewhere in Paul's letter, he, he actually outlined that in the beginning of 1 Corinthians saying, you know, nobody um, can get to heaven through their own works. Jesus Christ is the only one who can save us. But this life of sanctification is our response because if a person, you know, as James says, you know, if you say you have faith without works, he says, show it to me because I'll show you my faith by my works. So Paul, in essence, is really complimenting that by saying, you know, uh, if you have faith, then you're going to be running the race. If you're not running the race, maybe you really don't have faith. Maybe you're just fooling yourself. If you say, oh, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't need to go to church. It's like saying, well, I'm a runner, but I don't practice and I don't race, right? And what kind of runner are you? You know, I've never heard of it. It's like a basketball player or a fisher, who, a fisherman who never goes fishing, you know? Like my kids kind of joke with me because uh, I used to run cross country in college and kind of ever since college, which is, you know, my 25th anniversary of graduation is like this month. And, uh, and I, I don't run anymore. 
Uh, it's partly because I can't. My knees are bad. And, and so if I call myself a, a runner, my kids always tell me, yeah, Dad, you haven't run for 25 years. So, <laughs> so you know, it'd be like a Christian saying, you know, oh, I'm a Christian, but I don't really participate in the sport, of the running. So uh, we have a lifetime of, of running for the Lord, and that's what he's talking about. So I'm glad you pointed that out because it is about um, sanctification, not justification. That's why you have to persevere. So, yeah, so verse 26, he says, Therefore I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave so that I, after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. So he's letting us know that, uh, that in cri- the Christian life, it is possible for some people to, uh, to miss the mark, to, to really forget why you're doing it. Have you ever you know, just gone through the motions, sometimes going to church, and you, there's no joy, just kind of going through, you're just saying the, the words? That, Jesus doesn't want those type of followers. It, it doesn't mean that when you are kind of like going through the words that, that you're not a Christian anymore, it just means that if, if that's all it is for you, if it's just beating the air aimlessly or fighting like a man beating the air, that you are you're missing out on the, the, the life, the abundant life that Jesus Christ has uh, given us. A lot of us, are, yeah. lot of us yeah. do that. Yeah. And, ritual, right. And, well, and, and part of that has to do with, uh, f- that's why we, we want to encourage each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. It's important for us to help other people because Jesus is real through the hands and the feet of other people. Remember Jesus said, when you ever you did it, the least of my brothers, you did it to me. So we do that to others. We say, you know, oh, I missed you in church. You know, is, what's going on in your life? Do you need help? And I'll pray for you. Because by doing so, we're encouraging each other so that we don't drop out of the race. So you had a question? Well, I just, well, it, it, what I see in this last verse 27, he, see, he suggests that it is possible to preach and still be disqualified for the prize. Yes. So it's preaching, even for preachers, preaching is not enough. Exactly. Well, you're not saved by your preaching. Right. You're saved by your right. faith in Jesus Christ. And so it, he, even as great a preacher as he was, he says it's, not, right. just a, it's not just talking that yeah. gets it done. You exactly. can be disqualified if that's all you do. Right. Because think of the temptation. I mean, you think about like some of the um, TV evangelists. Um, What's, I can't remember some of their names right now, but I've seen some you know, shows like in 2020 and 60 Minutes where they've investigated, well, what's going on with some of these people? Well, they, encourage, they tell you to send in your money, and they talk about planting, you know, investing in their ministries. You send in $100, and God will give you 1000 you know, they And they, they become rich, and they get lots of money, and it goes to their head. And why are they doing it? Uh, I mean, I can't judge their heart. Only God can do that. But when the motivation for being a preacher is about the money or the fame or the prestige or people lifting you up or feeling good about yourself, those are all the wrong reasons. Jimmy Swagger, Peter yeah. Popoff, I think oh, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, remember uh, Jim Baker? I mean, he went to j- jail for um, embezzling millions of dollars. He felt he, he was due that money. He felt that he was doing the Lord's work, and so he was sharing in the bounty of... But the IRS saw differently. He was stealing the money of the ministry that people were giving. It wasn't given to, to buy another house. It was given for the work of that ministry, and he, he, in essence, stole it, and he went to jail for it. And in jail, he had a conversion. He realized that what he did was wrong, and he actually now is, I don't know if he's out of jail or not, but he's, he, written, he wrote a book recently. He says while he was in jail, he did a study of the red letters of the Bible. He read everything that Jesus said, and he came to the conclusion Oh, Jesus never said that by being a good Christian, you'll be rich. And so he... (laughs) (laughs) That's right. And so, and it's good to hear because he could have been one of those people who ran the race and disqualified himself because he didn't do it for the right reason. So by God's grace, he has repented. And I think that that is a powerful witness that he actually realized that he had done something horribly wrong. He had misled millions of people and he had taken advantage of them. And he's, he's sorry for what he did. He served his time and he's a forgiven child of God. And, and you come up even uh, lately, um, what, about two or three years ago, about the church, um, they had glass. Oh, the Crystal Cathedral? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What, and that's it's another sad ex- that's example. Awful. Right. Um, was the, the leader of the Crystal Cathedral is... 
Uh, it was, right. <laughs> yeah, the hour of power. Um, and so, yeah, I can't remember his name off the top of my head right now, but, you know, there was an example of a ministry that kind of was built on a person's personality. He was very charismatic, but unfortunately, you can't build a, a church on a pastor's um, charisma. It has to be built on the Word of God, and it has to be the motivation of the love for Jesus. And so, the, you know, that, that is an example. In the book of Ecclesiastes, it talks about how uh, that wealth and prestige and fame and power in this world is fleeting, that it's like the, like the, um, the fog, it, it's, it disappears quickly. And so if we put our trust in those things, we'll always be disappointed. But the one thing that will never leave us, that will never forsake us, is the love of God in Jesus Christ. There's a, there's a, it's interesting that you connected Jim Baker with the uh, Name It and Claim It uh, group. I can't think of the, some of those pastors. Right, There's this yeah. huge movement yeah, yeah. that still goes on that teaches oh, yeah. exactly that. Exactly. Exactly and that. that. The fruit of worship, the fruit of the obedience yeah. is dollars and cents. Yeah, I would say that the fruit of uh, faith is um, the fruit of the Spirit. That's what the Bible says, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. So if you're looking for something other than the fruit of the Spirit, then it's not biblical. It doesn't say, the Bible doesn't say that God doesn't bless people physically and materially, but it doesn't. It never guarantees that. See, and, and, and if your motivation is to get those things, then you're doing it for the wrong reason. So that's what Paul's warning. You know, I don't want to be disqualified for the prize. I have to believe what I'm preaching because you could be the best preacher in the world and not necessarily believe it. You know, there's a story about a story about um, Billy Graham had a friend in seminary that they learned in the Bible school together, and then his friend I can't remember his friend's name, but he was a very popular preacher around the same time as Billy Graham in the early time of his ministry, and this guy eventually became disenchanted with Christianity. Uh, no, was because what happened is the person um, who was a big, uh, was a very powerful preacher like Billy Graham, he became an atheist, and so he's actually he's, he writes books against Christianity now. So and, and there's a person who who preached powerfully, but was disqualified for the prize because now he he, he I think what happened is somebody in his family died, maybe it was his wife, and he and his faith um, he lost his faith because he blamed God. If God is real, why would this happen? And so obviously either God is not real, or God is evil. Because he took my my loved one from me. Yeah, my sister thought the same way. She lost two, yeah. two kids. The one uh, age three, one six years ago. Well, here, here's a, a question that might be a little tricky to answer. And that is, if the prize is sanctification, then is he saying it is possible to lose your sanctification without losing your justification? Mm, well, I would say that the prize isn't sanctification. Sanctification is the race. And then your the prize is is eternal life. Okay. God has already promised it to us, and it's not by our works that we receive it, but it can be refused, right? So God gives us eternal life, but only we can reject it, right? So it's not like once saved, always saved. I mean, there are some churches that, that teach that. I would say that you are given the gift of eternal life and that eternal life isn't something that happens in heaven it's something that you receive even now because there's joy in your salvation right now so your eternal life begins through faith in jesus i would say that it is possible to lose your faith but if that faith is ever lost it, it the only way it can be uh, regained is through the power of the holy spirit what's dead can be re resurrected so it, it, i would say a person might lose their faith and live a lifestyle where they reject jesus but that doesn't mean that they're completely lost until, until they die. If they come back to the Lord, then they can still be saved. But the problem is that the more you reject God, the harder it is to come back because um, once you've uh, spurned the Holy Spirit, once you've quenched the Spirit, then you, you've hardened your heart. And what happens when you harden your heart too much? Remember how the Pharaoh, he hardened his heart five times, and then after that, the last five times, it says God hardened his heart. Right? So the first time, five times that he, when the plagues he came, that's right, he did it. And, uh, and then the last five times it says, and then the Lord hardened his heart. In essence, it's like God saying, I'm withdrawing my grace. The opportunities to trust in me and my grace and mercy that I give to people, I'm withdrawing them. Not that he couldn't have changed his mind, but it's, it's like God, God was saying, uh, if this is the way you want it, so be it. 
And, and what happens is when a person rejects God's gospel and the Holy Spirit too many times, then their hearts become hardened. And God can harden that heart so that that person will get what they have been, what they desire. If they desire to live eternity without God, if they desire to live this life without God, God will give them eternity without God. And, and that's really what hell is. Yes. Ooh. Yeah. So uh, Paul is, you know, talking about how this is a very serious matter, and you know, he's uh, uh, the people who run in the Olympics, they take it seriously, and so if they take it seriously, how much more should we take it seriously that we're talking about an eternal gift that heaven is something that is worth running for? That's why I said, okay. watch over your your soul. Just don't give your soul up. Yeah. Remember, Jesus said. Um, what good is it if a person gains the whole world yet loses their soul? So, same type of thing. That's right. Okay, in chapter 10 then, he talks about warnings from Israel's history. So he's, he's using the Old Testament stories as an example of what happened to them. Here's people who were chosen by God. They saw the miracles of the uh, Exodus. They went into the wandering in the wilderness. They came to the promised land. And yet, many of them hardened their hearts and were lost Physically, whether or not they were condemned eternally, I would say it depends on what their state of faith was at the time they died. But God did punish them in the wilderness because of their disbelief. So he That's says, crazy. Yeah. yeah, and that it's, uh, you think, if I would have seen the miracles of the ten plagues, I would probably believe. Well, the fact is that as sinful human beings, we're just as susceptible of rejecting God as these people were. Yeah. But the difference is that these people in the Old Testament... God had not yet poured out his Holy Spirit on all the people. No. Even the disciples, remember how the disciples, they saw Jesus and they saw his miracles, but they were still afraid and in hiding until the Holy Spirit came on them at Pentecost. Well, I think of the parable of Lazarus and the, and the beggar and the poor right. man. Where, oh, yeah, yeah. Where Jesus, they, uh, where uh, Father Abraham says to Lazarus, hey, you know, Lazarus says to him, well, if you let me go up there and tell them or send yeah. Lazarus. Uh, send, right, my send brothers will turn. Up there. They'll, t they'll turn and, and he says, if they wouldn't believe the law and the prophets, they right. wouldn't believe somebody up there. Exactly. So yeah, so maybe that's what was going on with Israel. But So he uses Israel as, a, as an example of history. In chapter 10, verse 1, he says, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud and they all passed through the sea. Okay, so he's talking about the cloud of God's glory, right? So they had the presence of the Lord with them. They all passed through the Red Sea. They were saved. And then he uses this to describe, he says, they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food. They drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. So he's using this example of the, of the people of Israel going through the Exodus as an example of really people who were part of God's kingdom, Right? In essence, it's like saying these people were part of the church, but just because you're part of the church doesn't mean that everybody who's in the church is going to get into heaven because some of those people will be the people who will reject God's word, reject his miracles, and reject God ultimately. Uh, so notice that he describes the exodus passing through the cloud uh, and passing through the sea as a type of baptism because what is baptism, right? Right? where the word baptism means a washing. And it, it, before you go into the water, you're dirty. When you go into the water, you come out, you're clean. So think about the people of Israel. The Exodus was a type of baptism because on, when they were coming to the, dead, to the Red Sea, that is, they were slaves. They were being pursued by the Pharaoh. Once they passed through the Red Sea and the waters closed in behind them, what happened to their past? Were they still slaves? No. Was the Pharaoh still alive? No. Were their slave drivers still controlling them? No. Their slave, their, their past as slaves was gone, dead and gone. It was behind them, and there was no turning back. I mean, even they wanted to turn back. They couldn't go back to the Red Sea. It closed in behind them. Well, even, even though that's all it was in fact, exactly right, they still yearned to go back for the right. leaks and the, uh, and that's the, right. the, and the not, pleasures of Egypt. Yeah. And well, if you go back, you're going to have to be a slave. Yeah, but I don't like this food here. I want to I know. I want to go back. Isn't that sad? Yes. That's That shows the addiction of sin. The sin is like an addiction because, you know, think about an addict. Going back to your addiction is dangerous, will kill you, and it's a horrible life. And yet people crave for the sin that they know than, than for the freedom that they don't know, right? And that's, that's what sin is like. Yeah. Even for us, you know, a person, you might say, well, don't you know how much better your life would be if you stopped doing this thing? And, and a person says, 
well, I don't want to um, do what's right because I don't know, that's, that's something that is, um, I can't imagine what that life would be like. I'm comfortable in my sin, so I wanted to continue it. So now, the good thing is that God, God loves us as we are, but he loves us too much to leave us that way. I know a fellow who's, who smoked all his life. He's had uh, two, uh, two heart attacks. Mm -hmm. He's been in there. He's got four stents in his chest. Uh, he's a long history of these things, but he cannot stop smoking. Yeah. He knows he wants to quit. And that's the power of sin is even more than we're consciously aware of. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it has us. And the only thing that can break it is, is Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. That's right. Yeah. And, and that's the good thing about that is because... Uh, even when we cannot do anything to break ourselves free from the chains of sin, Jesus Christ is the one who um, loves us and pursues us, and, and he'll do whatever it takes. And sometimes what it takes, think about like an addict. What, what can cause some addicts to stop their addiction? Is they gotta hit bottom, right? In, in AA, they talk about how, you know, until you admit that you cannot control your life and you have to give, you have to acknowledge it only through a higher power, whether, you know, whatever that higher power might be, they, you know, most, mostly it's, you know, it, it started out as a Christian organization. So recognizing that God is the only way you can get yourself out of this, that's the same thing with sin. Until you recognize that you can't get out of your sin by yourself, that only through God can you do it, it's, it's that being poor in spirit. You know, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor in spirit, um, for they shall um, see God. And, and so through, through the... Um, the recognition that you uh, are hopeless and helpless on your own, that's when, where God can start working. You know, Paul said, I prayed three times that God would take away this thorn in my flesh, and Jesus said, I, I won't take it away, for it is in your weakness that my grace is made perfect. Yeah. So here he's using the description of the Old Testament Exodus, and he talks about how all these people who were part of the people of Israel, they ate the same spiritual food, which was the manna. They drank the same spiritual drink, which was the water that came from the rock. And he says that that rock that accompanied them was the rock, was the rock of Christ. Now, what a powerful example, because, you know, the water came from the rock and sustained them. And, and when Jesus comes, he actually says, you know, I am the bread of life. You know, your fathers ate manna in the, in the desert, but they still were hungry. But if you eat the bread that I give, then you will never be hungry again. And he, said, and he also said, I am the water, uh, the living water. Whoever drinks of this water, even though they are thirsty, they will never thirst again. So Jesus uses a description of himself as being, you know, in, in the Old Testament, it was like a, a physical, temporary um, gift of the water and the bread that kept them alive. Jesus offers us something that's not just temporary, but it's spiritual and eternal, so that through Jesus Christ, we will have um, uh, all of our uh, difficulties and problems and our thirsts and our hungers will be satisfied. They'll be taken care of. Uh, and so verse five, he, he says, you know, here's these people who had all this stuff. And he says, nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. And which goes to show that the power of sin in their lives needed to be rooted out. So many of those people were still yearning for their um, slavery past. So that's why God made them wander in the wilderness for 40 years. So that the, the only people who would get to go to the promised land were those who were born in freedom. Those who had been slaves and who were yearning for their slavery would have to be, go through the discipline of depending on God. And, it, and the people who went to the promised land were the children born in freedom. And those who were like from maybe the age of... Uh, right, because 20. the... Uh, it, well, most likely the age of uh, consent. Yeah, all the uh, children who were like under the age of 13 um, w went to the promised land, and all those born in the wilderness went to the promised land. All those who were older, the adults, would die in the wilderness. Well, there were some exceptions. Uh, Joshua, yeah, the, exactly. The only two were Joshua and Caleb. Caleb, yeah. And that's because when the, tr when the 12 spies went into the Canaan to, spy, to check it out, oh, yeah. 10 of the spies said, oh, you know, this land is filled with giants and we can never take it over. Mm -hmm. And Caleb and, and Joshua said, no, with the Lord we can do all things. Mm -hmm. And because the people of Israel sinned by believing the lies and the, fault, the, the doubters, um, you know, God said the only people who got to go to the promised land were Joshua and Caleb. And even Moses didn't make it. It wasn't, originally he probably would have gone, but because of his disobedience when God told him to, to speak to the rock, to produce water, it was like later on. 
And then he angrily hit the rock, and God said, because of your disobedience in front of the people, I, you will no longer be able to go to the promised land. So God's rules are very serious. You can't just ignore them. And so faithfulness is an important thing. But, um, but it's not our ability to be perfect that gets us in heaven. Uh, even Moses recognized that he didn't get to go to the promised land, but he still was under God's grace. He put his faith in God, and he was saved eternally. But he was made an example so that the people would realize how serious this was, uh, it was to obey God. So you say, you say under, God's, under God's grace. Right, under God's grace is when, you're, when you have faith, you're under God's grace. grace. Now the opposite of, opposite of faith is, is doubt, right? So the people were doubting God, and they doubted his goodness. They said, he led us out here to die. And God said, what are you talking about? Why would I do that? I gave you all, I gave you, you walked out of Israel. Why would I lead you out here to die? And, I, and he gave them the manna. And then they said, oh, the manna was so boring. And they, he gave them uh, quail and he gave, them, he gave them water. And so every time they complained, he punished them, but he still provided for them. Yeah, and when Moses went up the mountain, they immediately mm -hmm. built, almost immediately, they got built a golden right, the golden calf. calf. Yeah, so that's an example of again their sin, and uh, that's like you know us. We, God, you know, tells us what he what he wants to give us, and we still run after false gods. So idolatry is still a part of humanity, and uh, and we need to um, be disciplined to to protect ourselves from that because even you know even Christians can uh, fall away oh, yeah. when it comes to the the, the temptations of this world. Yeah. Thank God for what they could, uh, uh, call an applicator that you can go to and uh, acknowledge that he forgives. Yeah, God, God offers forgiveness. And so uh, he, he continues in verse 6. He says, Now these things occurred to, as examples to us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. So that's a quote from Exodus 32, 6. Because what did the people do? I mean, they, when they did the, um, the golden calf, it wasn't just that they made an idol. Part of the, that, the ca golden calf was a symbol of the god Baal. And the worship of Baal was um, something called the fertility cult. So part of the fertility cult was that to show Baal what, he wa what they wanted him to do, because he was the god who inseminated the earth through the rain, and then the earth goddess, which was... Um, Ashtoreth was the one who grew the crops. And so in essence, you needed to show the gods how they were to fertilize the earth by participating in cult prostitution. And so that's what he says, that they got up and they engaged in pagan revelry. In essence, they chose um, the pagan uh, kind of hedonism, the party attitude, the giving themselves over to their sin over the things that God had called them to do. So they were being uh, bad witnesses. They were rejecting God's grace. They were rejecting his law. And, it, he, and Paul, the reason Paul is telling this is because earlier in the book of Corinthians, there was an example of a man who was sleeping with his stepmother, mm. right? And so yeah, he, he, yeah, can, okay. he condemned that. And so he's trying to tell him, this is even the people of, of Israel participated in this type of sin and, the, and God condemned them for it. And he says in verse 8, we should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. So God punished the Israelites when Moses came down from the, uh, from the mountain and saw them uh, partying. Again, not just worshiping a golden calf, but they were engaging in cult prostitution. And he said, you know, that as a punishment, you know, um, some of them dropped dead. God struck dead 23,000 people on that day. Now, when they left Israel, or they left Egypt, it says in the uh, book of Numbers that, that there was 608,000 men of military age. So if you consider those men over 18, obviously, most of the Israelites at that time, you know, you would be married when you, got, when you were of age, right? So 18 or older men, 600,000, Plus, and then if they had a wife and they had probably one ch child, which would have been, you know, that would be conservative. So if you multiply that by three, so we're talking about at least 1.8 million people. So 23,000 is still a small group, but, you know, how sad that 23,000 people were killed as a, because of their sin. God used them as an example. 
to warn the rest because it's kind of like cancer. You only have a couple of cells in your body that are cancerous and if you don't cut them out, the rest of your body will die. If God didn't strike dead these 23,000 people, then the rest of the people might have gone to hell if they would have followed in the same path. So God sometimes has, he's a surgeon. He has to yeah. take drastic measures in order to save the body. And so the, the Israelites was the body of God's people and he wanted to save that body. And the same thing is true for us in the church that we should not allow sin to persist among us, but we, we are called to, not to judge, judging means you don't deserve God's grace and you're gonna to go to hell. But to correct others is to say, um, Matthew 18 tells us, if somebody sins against you, go to them and tell them so you may be reconciled. But if they won't listen, then bring a friend. And if they still won't listen, bring the church, which means talking about the elders and the pastor, so that that person might be saved. So you don't want people to go to hell. We want people to be saved. Uh, in the Old Testament, often God used people as an example of sin by punishing them physically so that more people would be saved spiritually. And so... Paul uses this as an example, and he goes on to say, verse 9, we should not test the Lord as some of them did and were killed by snakes. So that was the, pa that was the story in, in the book of Numbers with, the, um, with the, uh, the fiery serpents, and then Moses built the, uh, the bronze serpent that they could look upon and be saved. And in verse 10 he says, and do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. So he's actually giving us three stories from the book of Numbers about how these people got killed from different things, and uh, God was very serious. A lot of times people say, what kind of an evil God would kill innocent people? Well, nowhere in the Bible does God kill innocent people. But the fact is, none of us are innocent, right? Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So no one's innocent, and God is the one who gives life, and God has the right to take life away. So we should never blame God for people dying. We should, say, we should recognize if God, when a person's time is up, whether it's because of God's punishment or really um, because of the effects of sin, right? Because Adam and Eve are the one who brought sin into the world, and that's what death is. Death is the result of sin. So we can't blame God for that. And so um, we certainly will eventually die physically, but we can hasten our death if we are doing something that's sinful because, you know, sin... Sinful activities usually bring about an earlier death. Wages of sin. That's right. So, uh, so, obviously, some people who have not done anything wrong sometimes are, are casualties of sin. You think about the shooting of at Sandy Hook, those little innocent children were killed by a shooter. And some people wonder, well, what kind of a God would allow that to happen? Well, the same kind of God who allowed freedom of choice so that some people choose to do evil, and God doesn't stop him, because if he does, then he's stopping people from having the freedom of choice to love him also, because you know, otherwise we'd be like robots. If you programmed a computer to say, I love you every time you turned it on, sure, you might say you have a relationship with your computer, but it's not a real relationship. If a person, that's right, if a person doesn't choose to love you, it's not real love. So when God created humans, he said, I'm going to create humans with the ability to reject me because only then would I have the, the real relationship of them choosing to love me. You know, why is it uh, so many people use the word love? Uh, I love you, be safe, you know, and uh, as soon as you don't see eye to eye or agree with the person, then, you, then you're mad. So where is the love then? <laughs> well, that's because some people don't know what true love is, uh, which is uh, kind of defined in 1 Corinthians 13. It talks about um, love is patient, love is kind, does not keep a record of wrong, it does not uh, harm, it does not envy, it does not, um, it's not self-seeking. So if a person is, um, you know, withdraws himself from you or doesn't care about you anymore because you didn't do something they liked, then their love was self-seeking and it wasn't real love then. So God, only God's love is perfect. And as humans, God calls us to, uh, um, to try to follow in the footsteps and to, to love like Jesus did. And only through faith can a person really love like that. You know, it takes a lot of forgiveness, right? Jesus loved us and he forgave us. And even though we continue to hurt him through our sin, he still loves us and we just need to seek his forgiveness. C.S. Lewis says, 
you know, it's a book called The Four Loves, and it talks mm -hmm. about there are different kinds of loves. Yeah. Right. Well, people get those things mixed up. Yeah, that, that's because in the Greek language, there's four words for love, and English is only one. So unfortunately, we're at a um, disadvantage because when we say, I love my dog, I love ice cream, I love my wife, I love God, and we're using the same word, but in Greek, you would have to use different words. Uh, and so in order to qualify those, you can talk about how like agape is, is divinely love, divine unconditional love, and uh, eros is attraction, sexual love, and filio is um, brotherly love. Right, and so all those in Cairo, Kairos, Kairos is a, like charity or love of humanity. So there's different types of love, and we if we confuse them, then we don't recognize you know that there's only one kind of unconditional love, and that's the love we're all called to. Uh, that's the love that will last, and that's the love that is patient, kind, does not keep a record of wrongs, it's not self-seeking, not easily angered. Yeah, you need to do a lesson, a lesson or a report on that because. Um Mm -hmm. uh, Sunday was a uh, um, football game, Sunday, mm -hmm. yeah. and so uh, the statement was made to me, uh, Betty, you, you, was, you would try to defend the devil, uh, and I said, no, and he said, well, how do you think that you can find all this goodness in people when you know they've done bad, and I said, uh, if God forgive him, who am I? You know, so it kept on going on and on, and until I just finally got up and left and say, because can't nobody love like that. But it is definitely better to um, to give people the benefit of the doubt and to give them second chances. Now, I, I think there's a difference between saying, I love you and I forgive you, and letting people walk all over you, yeah. right? Yeah. So, I mean, it, trust is, one, is something that is earned. Love is something that you should give freely. So, you can love a person, and if you, they keep sinning, then you need to uh, allow them, you, you don't have to let them hurt you anymore. But you can still say, I love you, but you need help, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's, it's always better to, to look at people with uh, that kind of positive attitude. That's the way Jesus did it, right? He didn't, even, even um, Judas, who was about to betray him, you know, he, he, didn't, uh, he, he didn't give up on him. I think that the Garden of Gethsemane, when he was giving him the kiss, he, you know, he, he kind of looked at him and said, you know, do you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And it was like he was saying, you know, I'm giving you another chance. If you're sorry, then, you know, I, I can still forgive you. But he, he couldn't break away from his the belief, you know, Judas's belief that, that he needed to do, uh, be in control, I guess. You know, he, he probably felt... Jesus is the Messiah, but the only way he's ever going to become uh, successful is if he starts a rebellion. Because, you know, Judas was a zealot, which was a Jewish group that was trying to overthrow the Romans. That's where he came from. His background was he was a zealot, it says in Scripture. So he wanted to throw, overthrow the Romans, and he wanted Jesus to do what he wanted him to do. And so when Jesus didn't do what he wanted him to do, he took measures into his own hands. Jesus was saying, you know, if you turn back now, it's not too late. You know, in the, in the Last Supper, he even said, you know, um, he talked about how, uh, how bad it is for the person through whom the betrayal would come. And, you know, that this person is being led to hell. And, and it, it wasn't so much that, that Judas, you know, was always evil because he had these tendencies of, of evil, but he allowed them to, to snowball until they became uh, out of control because it says that when he, when the time came the devil entered into him yeah, and then he betrayed that. Jesus he betrayed now the devil cannot take over or possess a person unless they have allowed it so the fact that he had opened his life to sin that he willingly allowed his his life to be used by the devil the devil entered into him in essence to say I'm not going to let you chicken out now. We're going to get, get rid of Jesus and I'm going to use you. And he allowed himself to be used because he rejected Jesus as the Messiah. He rejected Jesus as the authority in his life. He rejected Jesus as the master. He, in essence, wanted to be the master of Jesus. I'm going to, I'm going to move your destiny with my work. I'm going to make sure that you... Uh, you know, maybe he thought Jesus was going to um, fight. If I push his buttons and I get him arrested, maybe he'll call upon the angels from heaven and fight against the Romans, and then we'll start the rebellion. And in essence, that's what Jesus said in the garden. He says, 
I could call down a legion of angels right now, but I'm not. Well, Caiaphas also thought something would happen when Jesus was uh, murdered for the sake of the nation. He right. Oh, yeah, the prophecy, uh, because he was God's instrument, even though he didn't accept Jesus, he said it's better for one man to die for the people than the whole nation to, to perish. Mm -hmm. And, and he, it says, and he said that because he was uh, prophesying as the high priest. And it was true. It is better for one person to die than for the nation, mm -hmm. the, the people of God, to be destroyed. God would rather allow his son to die than for every person to go to hell. And Jesus willingly did that, as it says in Philippians 2. For the joy set before him, he endured the, uh, the cross, scorning its shame, so that you know, he might save us. One of the things that's been interesting to me recently is the thought that uh, Judas was the only one of the disciples, of the twelve, who did not see the resurrection. Well, because he killed himself. He, he died yeah. before that. Right. And I think his faith, whatever faith he had, or did not extend even a few days to see the resurrection. Now, others, the others, the other twelve were confused. Yeah. And they were, until they, then, then they begin to see the yeah. resurrection. The resurrected Christ was there. Right. And then they began to put things together and came out roaring. Yeah. Uh, to start this new faith. That, yeah. And, 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 but he didn't. He didn't. Uh, right. Have that much faith. He didn't. Have Perhaps uh, he his faith. He allowed his faith, like the so seed of the sower, you know, to to die. That it. God gave him the faith. But it landed on, on, on a hardened heart. And so it, Jesus even said, when the, the seed that's on the path, the birds take it away. And he says, that's the, like the devil who snatches the word before it can ever grow. So perhaps you know, he, he, had, he had hardened himself so much against God's word that when the chance came for it to grow, the devil snatched it away. Mm -hmm. And you know, that, the, the parable it tells us we need to be have we need to have the soil of our hearts prepared for the word to grow and how do we do that well if you have a hardened heart it needs to be broken and it even says in, in psalm 51 uh it says sacrifices you do not desire but a broken and contrite heart O lord you will not despise so the broken heart is really the breaking of that soil so that god's word can grow in us okay let me finish this little section here he talked about how um in verse 11, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. Amen. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Boy, mm, I need those scriptures. Yeah. Mm. And what a powerful uh, promise because... A lot of times we think, I can't help myself. It's, it's not my fault. And we try to justify our sin. In fact, God promises that he will provide a way out. So nothing that happens to you is any different than, you know, even different than Jesus. Jesus was tempted. All the temptations that we experienced, Jesus experienced. You might say, well, gosh, Jesus is perfect. How could he be tempted? You know, obviously it's not fair. If he was perfect, he wouldn't have ever fallen. But the fact is that... Temptation is an invitation to sin. And Jesus was given the same invitations to sin as we are. And by God's grace, you know, Jesus, he, not only did he show us that by overcoming temptation, he was being our example, but in essence, he was, he was um, overcoming temptations to be our substitute. Mm -hmm. So think about it like this. When you fail, Jesus doesn't say, do a better job. He says, when you failed, what I did is I stepped into your shoes and I fulfilled God's word for you. I was your substitute. So when God, through faith in me, Jesus says, my Father in heaven doesn't see your sin. He sees my perfect life in your place, covering you, fulfilling the law, giving you the gift of eternal life. One of the, the, one of the scripture means very meaningful to me is the one where it talks about no temptation. Uh, well, no, wait. Um, Verse 13, yeah. He will not let you be, uh, uh, okay. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Uh, yeah, you know, that's not exactly what I, I was remind, remembering, so. But, uh, but the common, when I've been going through some pain recently, going to the doctor, I'm going to the hospital, whatnot, and, and the temptation is to say, you know, God, why are you doing this to me? But when I read the scripture, I realize that that is the common lot of man, for people to die, for their bodies to degrade, for them to, 
for the pain to feel. The pain is a good news. Something's wrong. Now you're going to need to go heal it. Yeah. Uh, emergency, the emergency at the hospital is a place where they give you healing, where they take the pain away. And, but that's the common lot of man for the bodies to be falling apart. So when yeah. I feel my body going in that direction, mm -hmm. I think, I'm, this is not God doing this. God has provided the healing. Yeah. This is the common, the common lot of humanity. Right. It, and the Bible tells us, and somehow I don't understand it, that it, it, that, uh, it came from the introduction of sin right. in the Garden of Eden. And yeah, so if we have anybody to blame, it's Adam. Yeah. Adam and Eve, right? We, uh, uh, but Jesus is, um, God's desire is for us to be recreated. You know, actually later on in the book of Corinthians, he talks about how, you know, a, a seed must die. You know, you plant it in the ground and that seed dies and then a new plant comes from it. And he says that, you know, our bodies are planted as, um, as uh, mortal, but, they're, that, but they uh, grow into the immortal life. So the body that we have now is only temporary. The body we have in heaven will be immortal and glorious. And, and so we have to pass from this life into the next life through the gateway of death. Death is a gateway to the eternal life. And sure, we have a body now, but the, the glory of glorified body will be given in heaven, will be indestructible, it will not grow old, it will not get sick, it will not die. And so that, why would we want to hang on to a, a shell that is wasting away? And Paul says this, and Jesus says this life is wasting away, and it, it was never meant to last because it was infected with sin. The only way that we can have what God intended is for it to be recreated, to be given a new body that is not susceptible to the um, sins and the temptations and the death of this life. So that's the attitude to have. You know, uh, we shouldn't get mad at God. We should ask for his strength. We should persevere in this life. We should go for, the, look, you know, run for the prize because heaven is our home. This life is not our home. This life is a sinful world. Sure, we can use the things of this life, but don't fall in love with them. Don't try to stay here. You know, when I was in uh, college, I uh, was preparing to go to seminary, and I during the summers I would spend my time working as a as a uh, waiter in a restaurant, and I got to know the people, and I got to know the menu, and I enjoyed it. And I even said one time to a girl who was I was working with, you know, this is kind of a fun job. I really like it. And she says, "Don't you dare drop out of seminary." To become, an, uh, uh, to become a, a waiter. She says, you were meant for so much more. And I'm all, well, thank you. I didn't actually th say I was going to drop out. But she said, you know, I'm not going to be able to do what you're doing. You need to finish your, 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 your graduate school and become a pastor because that is what you need. And I, I was thinking, that's a good example of what life is like. Sure, it might be, you know, some, there might be things that are enjoyable in this life, but we weren't meant to be here. We have something greater ahead of us, and that is to go to heaven. And that's what Paul is trying to, to tell the Corinthians, and that's what he uh, is trying to tell us. Okay, so uh, we'll stop here with, um, next week we'll start on verse 14.